Welcome to week four. Here we go. We're in the shop, as you can tell, in the secret layer, making some changes, uh, drilling some stuff up, and uh, just kind of had a really cool conversation with Mikey. I haven't been able to talk to him in the last couple of weeks, but was able to send him some information. He was able to make some suggestions. We're actually going to drill a short pin more hook pearl ball to see if we can uh, get ourselves a little bit more length and a little easier to read reaction we're also gonna make uh we're gonna try some changes um because i've been getting that issue on the inside of my finger we're going to try drilling the finger hole in a ball rather than putting a grip in it might just be that the grip is ripping on it creating too much bridge so we're gonna try drilling it we're also gonna make a pitch change, our very first pitch change. In uh, taking a look at my stats, Mikey noticed that I might have too much tilt. I'm on the high side of tilt for two-handers. So we're going to move my middle finger. Right now it's at 1.8 forward. We're just gonna make a small change. We're gonna make it zero, just to decrease my tilt a little bit, get it to roll a little bit more, and uh, see if we can kind of smooth that reaction out. So we're gonna drill, we've got on the press right now, we've got a Defender Hybrid that we're gonna drill up. We're gonna give that a test to see if that makes a difference. Hopefully it does, and if it makes my uh, uh, fingers more comfortable and it doesn't tear it up then uh we'll do a little bit of filling and drilling in that one and one thirty second hole and just drill it to being seven eighths it's not a big deal it's just time consuming and product consuming but we'll get there so uh let's make some dust so mikey was really good we went over a few things uh we went over some layout stuff uh we're also with this ball that we're um trying the no grips in uh we're also going to be drilling this as a low flare, more hook uh, hybrid. Really liked what I saw out of the mindset, uh, but we haven't been getting a lot of oil here in Barry lately, so I have to make sure that the ball can get down lane. Uh, so we're gonna give this a try and see if this will give us something that's maybe a little bit more of a bridge before our lowest end stuff, um, and give us another tool in our bag. shots where I'm going to try incorporating just a little bit more of not a push away but just a little bit more getting the ball moving forward before I start most of the time I leave the ball where try to leave it where it is um, just extend my elbow a little bit and I'm still not able to generate all of the ball speed that I need so uh, I'm going to try a slight push away uh, just to get a little bit longer of a swing, uh, line up my lower body and my upper body timing a little bit more and see if we can't create a little bit more ball speed. So as I said, uh, one of the things we were going to do this week is we were going to kind of take a look at what I have currently in my bag. Now I know there's going to be some revisions coming up as I've got some new pieces coming in uh, that I'm going to replace uh, some of these pieces with but for now let's uh, let's kind of take a look here all right so we start with my current benchmark which is my rattler for those of you using the uh, new troublemaker uh, deviate layout system this is a one and a half inch uh, pin to center of grip five and a half inch pin to pat. I will also put the uh, two LS layouts over there to the left. Then we've got my mindset. This is a short pin more hook. Just something that's a little bit more than the Rattler. A um, little bit earlier, a lot more hook. Um, I really don't need help getting the ball to hook, so this, the short pin, it uh, retains a little bit of tilt, gets it a little bit farther down lane, uh, but wow, does it ever hook down lane. Uh, next up here, this is my twist. Uh, this is drilled relatively strongly, um, but it is still a twist. 
Then of course we've got the 3D offset attack here is a fairly strong layout. Um, this is our one that we can really uh, take advantage of the friction. Then we've got a defender here, hybrid, with a short pin, more hook layout. Same layout as we, we've got on our mindset here. Uh, but it's going to give us a lot more length, a little bit more angular down lane. It's not necessarily going to be for used for angular, but something that we can control. It's going to be a little bit cleaner to get down lane and still have some hook. Then we've got our spare ball. Next, just about to uh, put new finger holes in our trailblazer, which is our short pin less hook. It's something that we can really control the lanes with. We got one more out front here. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, you might know what it is. It's a troublemaker. And we went with the three inch uh, pin to center of grip with a five inch pin to pap. It's five and three quarters inch center of grip to pap, I believe it was. Uh, so this is a very strong, very, very strong high flaring. Uh, so this gives us a little bit of everything on the lanes. Um, it's going to give us something that we can ball up to if we've got to move left early. Something we can ball down to if we've got to control the lanes. Gives us a little bit of every reaction. So that way, there isn't a lot that we're going to run into that we can't uh, that we can't deal with. And hopefully soon we'll have a new uh, purple hammer that we'll be able to add to this. And that'll give us every reaction I think that we'll need to uh, at least be competitive and at least be able to uh, get out there and start scoring again as a two-hander. All right, let's talk about the PAL system just for one second here. Why it is superior um, for when you're laying out your two-handed bowling balls. Um, things, because PAPs change the way the core is oriented in the ball, if you only use dual angle, like I, I say, you know, my say my mindset is 45 by two and a quarter by I think I said 40 or something like that. Um, if I only use that, if you actually chart back where the core numbers are, the mass bias ends up being a half inch different than where it would be on a PAL layout. So you have just a little bit of a slightly different core tilt on it, which is why it rolls differently for two-handers than one-handers. Good morning. It, uh, once again, another bright early morning. I got myself a protein. Uh, it's gonna be 26 degrees today, but I still got a sweater on. Um, because I'm weird. Uh, getting ready to do some training. And, uh, I figured before I do that, it's the best time to kind of go through, uh, what we talked about last week in our training plan. Um, so I'm going to put up on the screen here two parts of our training plan. One's going to be our identification plan, which you'll see now. And the second part is going to be our actual action plan. That's how we're going to address what we identified in our identification plan. Makes sense, right? Um, so what I've done here is I've tried to take... I always try to take three different parts of my game uh, when I look at identifying things that I need to do better. If I've uh, got a weakness or an opportunity for growth, uh, or I've identified something that I'm doing wrong uh, or that I could do better. <clears throat> Notice how I'm always changing those up. They start like, hmm, that's bad. And then the second time I say it, it's, oh, you know, that's not so bad. Just just remember that, okay? Um, so in my identification plan, 
what I do is I look at a, a physical aspect, so a training aspect with my actual uh, general physical preparation. So in this case, we're looking at low ball speed caused by leg strength or by poor lower body timing alignment. So that means, um, one, I'm pretty strong in my legs, but since all of our power as two-handed bowlers is created through our legs, I need to make sure that my legs are in the best condition I can put them in. Now for you out there who are making the change over who don't necessarily, you're thinking to yourself, why do I have to make a big investment in my health? You don't have to. Um, myself, being a, uh, you know, part of the national coaching team for Team Canada, as well as somebody who has some uh, physical challenges with my fibromyalgia, I take my physical health very seriously. If I take a step back, if I don't focus on my heat, on my eating, on my uh, stretching, and on keeping my strength up, I will lose it all. So for me, identifying a physical part of my game to work on is just, it's a regular thing. It's just taking my regular daily workout, whatever I'm doing, and specifically modifying it to work on key parts. Um, so leg strength. If you look over at the action plan, um, the ways I'm looking at increasing leg strength physically, looking at um, you know, squats, lunges, step ups, banded jumps. So I'm looking at exercises that will create uh, leg strength, but also explosive leg strength. Funny thing, a lot of people when they look at squats, um, they're like, oh yeah, load the bar up. I got like a thousand pounds on the bar and I'm gonna go down and go up again. That's great for strength. But you can actually do things like lighter weight. Um, one of the exercises I will do is 60% of my one rep max. And then I try to cover the distance from my low uh, point in my squat to full extension as quickly as possible. Uh, safely as quickly as possible. Uh, which means I'm trying to create explosive strength. So like when I'm going into that last step, when I'm going from my plant into my slide, um, you know, I'm creating explosive strength in my legs to make up for the fact that we don't have that arm swing. Makes sense, right? Um, same thing you can do with lunges, uh, banded jumps. Uh, you can put a couple of bands across you, or you could hold weights or things and just do jumps. We're just trying to create explosive strength uh, because I'm a very strong person. Um, people, obviously you can see, I'm not a small guy. Um, but explosive strength is something that I, I lack. See, so we got some things that we're running into here. We've got some causes, we've got some effects, and we can see that a lot of them are coming together to create things. So, our physical changes we're gonna make, leg strength. Poor lower body timing alignment, that's something we've gotta work on with video. So we're gonna look at to make sure that my rhythm and my timing in my feet is matching up to where it needs to be with my upper body making sure that I'm not lagging behind or being too fast, uh, running to the line. So I wanna make sure that my alignment timing is correct because there's a definite difference between the upper and lower body timing between a one-handed bowler and a two-handed bowler um, because the, the length of the swing, because the power generation, there's a lot of different things going in there. So we gotta make sure that those line up. Second part we look at in the identification plan here is scoring stats. This is one that people miss out on all the time and it's, you can download apps. I use my lane play. Uh, you can get pin pal. There's all sorts of different apps uh, for your phones. 
And uh, you can see here, I've just identified, you know, how often I hit the pocket, how often I strike, um, how often I'm making spares, and, and what my percentage of closed frames is, uh, which is, you know, how many frames I'm actually closing versus how many are open. Makes sense. Uh, so you can see here, pocket percentage, I'm hitting the pocket 50% of my shots on my first ball. My goal is 67%, so I need to increase the amount of times I'm hitting the pocket. That makes sense, right? You hit the pocket more, your score is going to go up. Strikes, 37% of the time I'm striking. That's not good. Um, the goal here is 60% of the time I'm striking when I, when I throw it in the pocket. So that's a pretty large chunk. That's 23%. Um, so 23% uh, area that I can increase my scores from. Spare shooting. And this one, very disappointed in myself. But I, I knew this was going to happen as I learn uh, the two-handed game. 57% of my spares I'm making. So just over half of them. Goal is 85%. Uh, so we're looking at 28% uh, percent difference between where I am and where I need to be. That's uh, one-third of the time. That's a huge opportunity for score increase. For you uh, players out there who have uh, an average under 200, if you look at your spare percentage and compare it to a goal say like this, 85%, um, you can really look at how just, you know, an extra one spare a game, one less open a game, can seriously affect your score. And then closed frames. 71% of my frames are closed. The goal is 90%. Uh, once again, it's 19%. So, you know, one in five. Um... That gives us some tangible goals that we can look at, or tangible data that we can look at that tells us exactly where we are and where we need to be. So let's figure out how we're going to get there. Spare shooting. We said that there's a huge opportunity there to make some pins up. What am I leaving most? You see, 10 pins, 4 pins, and 7 pins. And I just went in my app and looked. What pin am I leaving the most? What's second? What's third? Just percentages. Let's look at what I'm missing the most. Ten pins. Well, if I'm leaving the most of them, and I'm missing the most of them, I'd say right there, there is something that we got to work at. That's a big red flag. Just... Um, I need to be making at least 90% of those, right? So we're talking about 20 to 21 out of 22. Uh, three pin, I made two of four of them. I should never miss a three pin. That's a pocket shot. But if you look at my pocket percentage, you see I'm only hitting the pocket 50% of the time. So that's showing me that uh, my aim or something that's going on with how I'm getting the ball to the pocket, that needs to be addressed. Remember how we talked about how we're finding positives? We're not saying this is bad. When you, when you are evaluating yourself or another person, it's really important that you don't look at these things as a negative. If I could sit here and look at, um, you know, 11 of 22 10 pins, and I could be like, God, I'm terrible. I miss so many 10 pins. This is awful. I can't make a 10 pin, blah, blah, blah. That gets into your brain. That negative self-talk gets into your brain and it trains you not only to doubt yourself, but it actually trains you to fear what you've done wrong. So the next time, if I looked at it, it's like, oh man, I keep missing 10 pins. Oh, I can't make one, I can't make one. The next time I go up to make a 10 pin, guess what's in my brain? Oh, I always miss these. How am I going to get this? Oh, I just know I'm going to miss it. You keep telling yourself you're going to miss it. 
you're going to find a way to miss it. Negative self-talk is super destructive to your game. Now we're identifying things, though. We can look at these as opportunities. Okay, this isn't a bad thing. That's 90, 90 to 110 pins that I can get, that I can take. Those are free to me. All I got to do is make a 10 pin. That's it. 10 pins are easy. I can do those one-handed. I just need a little bit of practice two-handed, right? Same same level, same thing I want to accomplish, much different way of talking about it. You know, when I'm done talking about, yeah, that's 110 pins, 90 to 110 pins that I can take, that's exciting. I want those pins. I want my average to go up that much. Um, so just remember that when you're figuring out, when you're identifying places of opportunities of growth, see, opportunities of growth, um, keep it positive in your in your own mind. Make sure you telling yourself it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes because you know you can fix them later. You can learn how to do it. Back to this thing. Um, 610, 204. There's that 10 pin popping up again. If we can properly address this so that I am more confident and more able to make 10 pins, take that 700 that we've, we're shooting the first couple of weeks, that's now an 840. That's pretty good, right? Right? See, we're getting somewhere. That's for four games, for four games, not for three. No, no, just for four. Another scoring thing, backup ball. Now this, I put just a little note for myself here. Since I'm missing so many 10 pins because the ball is hooking, often it'll get down lane and when I'm missing it, it's hooking past it on the left. Might be an opportunity to work on a backup ball so that I can eliminate that issue from my game. See, positives. So that's looking at uh, the game from a scoring way, we've looked at it from a physical training way, and now we're going to look at it from an actual physical execution standpoint. So we're going to look at my release. Um, I've complained about this a few times, you guys have seen me do it, I do that little spinning thing where I'm throwing the ball into the ground. Obviously there's something going on with my release. Because my arm swing won't throw the ball into the ground, my legs won't throw the ball into the ground, the only thing that will throw the ball into the ground is the thing that's attached to the ball. So I'm either um, uncupping my wrist in the wrong spot, or I'm rolling at the wrong spot, or I'm, I'm trying to explode and I'm exploding it into the wrong spot, and I'm thumbing it into the ground. Um, so we got to look at it. Uh, got to look at my release a little bit. So some of the things I put down there, I feel like I'm. I, I need to roll the ball, not throw it. Uh, I don't need to muscle the ball so much. I don't need to force the ball down lane. The more I force it, the less accurate I'm going to be, the less I can repeat shots. Um, loft. That's something I'm going to need to learn to do. I'm need to, going to need to be able to get the ball over the heads because my rev rate's going to go up. Uh, I know that being able to deal with the dry is going to be important. I've dealt with it all my life, uh, being a low-tilt one-handed bowler. So... Um, Doing this two-handed really, it's just going to be a, you know, same thing, just a new trick. And if I go back to one-handed bowling, it's going to give me another trick that I can go to later in a block. Um, and once again, release the backup ball. It's come up again. Uh, this might be an opportunity if they're too dry, maybe being able to throw it like a, a Simonson, throw it up the left-hand part of the gutter. Um, for spares, being able to back it up into the 10 pin. Uh, and lastly, don't worry about striking. The goal is clean frame. Uh, this is something that I remind myself very often. You know, some people call it strike for show, putt for dough. Um, or was it uh, strike for show, spares for dough? I think I was doing the golf one. You know what I mean? Spares, clean frames. It's very hard to not throw a, a decent game if you get a spare in every frame. You know, if you have a clean game, a strike, maybe two strikes and some spares, you're gonna shoot 200. So just let's get some clean frames. And if you look back at our scoring breakdown, clean frames. Well, if we go back to closed frames, 71% to 90%, three extra, three extra closed frames a game puts us over that 90%. It all ties together. It all comes together. It all comes together. Um, <clears throat> so, let's hop over to my action plan. And uh, we've got a loose outline of how we're going to address these issues. And as I go, I'm going to get more and more specific 
with my training. If I don't find progression from my first identification plan to my second one, I'm going to break the problem or the growth, the opportunity uh, down into smaller parts and start breaking it down into smaller parts until I can start mastering those parts and then I'll put it back together again. So increasing ball speed. We talked about leg strength. So I broke it down. Squats, lunges, step ups, banded jumps, one and two leg. We're going to create some explosive strength for me. Rather than just raw strength, I can deadlift 450 pounds. That doesn't mean I can throw the ball. I can create speed with my legs. I need to be able to create that fast speed. Uh, so we're going to do it. On the bottom there, align lower body timing. So we're going to take some video. We're going to find out where my timing is now and where we need it to be. And then we're going to try to adjust and align those timings so that we get into the right spot. How are we going to do that? Video. Okay, part two, ball rotation and control. So we're looking at those scoring stats. We're seeing a lot of wild shots, uncontrolled shots. We need to keep our hand inside of the ball during the swing. We need to, sorry. Earthquake! No, I keep banging on the um, on the table. Uh, we need the lead with the pinky. Keep the hand on the inside of the ball during the swing. Keep our forearm up. We've talked about that a few times in our training video. I showed you my digital way of working on that so I can see it. I'm gonna continue to do that because I've been getting better at it, uh, but I still have to make sure that I keep on the inside of the ball. I don't wanna come around it, which leads to the next part. Drive through the ball, don't spin around it. The more you spin the ball as a two-hander, it's gonna become more and more susceptible to the wet dry we want to create a little bit more roll especially forward roll so that we can turn all that revolutions into power at the pin deck um watch my elbow flare every two-hander has this when you bring it out you know get your elbow away from your body and stuff i got to make sure i keep my my arm nice into my body i don't let my arms flare out too much so i can keep that that swing plane nice and straight um, and rotation control, we've got backup ball. So we are going to start practicing a backup ball. Makes sense. We identified it as something that could help us with our scoring and could help us with our release. So we're gonna work on it. Spare shooting practice, right there. 10 pin. How are we gonna make the extra nine to 110 pins there? We're gonna work on shooting 10 pins. We're gonna shoot them normally, we're gonna shoot them with backup ball. Might spend an entire practice just shooting 10 pins until I can do it with my eyes closed, just so I can make up those pins. 610 practice, something I can practice with my 10 pin. Same thing, normal and backup ball. I can just make sure that I'm never going to miss those pins. I'm never gonna give away those spares ever again. Four pin and seven pin spares. Now, you'll notice in my spare shooting, I leave them a lot, but I do not miss them. And we're going to continue to make sure that I make them by practicing them. Just because I'm good at them doesn't mean I won't practice them. It's important. People often are like, oh, we you know what? I do this well. I'm not going to work on it. No. Work on all parts of your game. If we become well-rounded, we become better athletes. And lastly, our release. So we're going to work on rolling the ball. Going to do some drills, get down and work on just getting it off my hand, rolling it, letting it roll down my hand. Explosion point, making sure I'm hitting the ball forward. Same thing as I'm rolling it down, hitting it forward. We want to create roll uh, with distance, not just revolutions. A lot of people, when they two hand, they just pull up as hard as they can, like a lawnmower, and they create lots of revolutions, but no speed. We need to make sure that we get the ball launched forward with revolutions so we can create both distance and revolutions. Not that being able to create revolutions without distance is a bad thing. It's a tool that we can have in our bag for certain patterns, but it's not how we want to create our normal shot. And keeping our hand relaxed. We talked about it earlier, um, made some huge changes with our grip. Uh, we've eliminated inserts, so we have to just keep my hand relaxed, don't grip the ball. That way we don't create blisters. And we'll see if I move back into grips. I may stay without them, which is really weird. It's the first time I think in my entire, uh, probably since I was 12, that I haven't used grips in a ball. So it's really weird for me, but still gotta keep our hand relaxed, just like in one-handed bowling, grip pressure. So there we go. We've created an identification plan. We've identified ways that I'm going to get better as a two-hander, and we've identified how we're gonna do it. So um, for you out there who are watching the show, I challenge you to do the same thing. 
If you want to become a better bowler, identify where how you're going to grow. Identify those points, you know, those those growth opportunities and how you're going to take advantage of it. I've just identified how I'm going to get a, a free 140 pins a series. Free 140 pins. How many free pins are you going to get? All right, I'm going back to practicing. I've talked enough here. Let's go. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a show. So until next time, guys, we'll see you lane side.